So I'm Lisa Shaw. Um, I'm a presenter on BBC Radio Newcastle and as a County Durham lass, I am very proud to say that I'm also an ambassador for the County Durham Community Foundation. Isabel, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Isabel Owens. I'm the Deputy Chief Exec at the Rape and Sexual Abuse Counselling Centre in Darlington and County Durham. So the reason for our conversation today is to talk about how Isabel and her team at Darlington Rape and Sexual Abuse Counselling Centre have been supporting women and reducing inequality with the help of funding from the County Durham Community Foundation. So Isabel, I have a few questions. We'll have a bit of a conversation and I want to find out as much about you and about the service you provide as I possibly can. So first question, Isabel pre-pandemic, if we can remember that far back now. Tell us about the centre, tell us about the work you were doing. Yeah, so we support um, survivors of sexual violence right across Darlington and County Durham. We're a women's organisation um, led by women for women. Um, and we support any survivor across Darlington and County Durham who's ex experienced any form of rape or sexual abuse. Um, we have a helpline that is uh, run by volunteers. We provide specialist sexual violence counselling, which is long term counselling. Um, we also have independent sexual violence advisors who support people who might be thinking about reporting to the police or who are going through the criminal justice system. And we also have groups that are um, women only groups for survivors uh, to come together to learn from each other and to support each other essentially. So a real range of services obviously and obviously some I would imagine women come to you at a really vulnerable really traumatic time in their lives. Yeah absolutely it can be it can be you know when someone's in crisis maybe when they've been assaulted quite recently but also it can be it can have happened a very long time ago maybe 30 40 years ago and um, someone's just got to the stage in their life where, where they want to seek su support for that. So it can be something really quite recent or it can be something a long time ago. And often um, survivors can be quite vulnerable when they come to us, but also by accessing to support, they're being incredibly uh, brave and are taking a step forward um, for their own recovery and, and through their own empowerment as well. Yeah. And some of this, you know, is face to face, isn't it? Like you say, you run groups where women can come, they can get that peer support that I would imagine they really, really would need and value. Women who like them would probably understand the situation they are in, the situations they have been in. Um, tell us a little bit about those groups and what you might do with those groups. Yeah, so we've got a few different groups. Um, we've got the Recovery Toolkit, which is a, like a 12 week program for survivors who've left abusive relationships Relationships, and that's about recovery essentially like learning the tools that are going to help you recover from that um that uh, abusive relationship we also have a mindfulness group where a small group of survivors come together to practice the tools of mindfulness which is essentially you know strengthening your own self-care resources together and then we also have the peer support group which is a group held in darlington um, who are all survivors, they come together to support each other and they direct what's done in that group. They've done loads of different things. They've done a lot of craft together. Um, so we've got um, someone who's really good at watercolours. We've got someone who likes knitting. We've got someone who's a baker. And then they all learn skills together off each other. But they've also done things like drumming, go out and do gardening lots of different things um and it's about giving people the space like you say where you know that the other person understands might have a different experience but understands the place that you're coming from and are able to offer support to each other but also grow and learn together in a really safe and closed space where they know um that they'll be supportive be believed and won't be judged do you think there is a stereotype, a preconceived idea, perhaps, of the type of woman that might come to you? And what would you say? Do you have a typical survivor? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of myths about rape. I think when people think about rape and um, they imagine that um, it typically is like a young woman out on a night out is raped down a back alley, that it's a young, attractive woman and um, that she's white. Um, and that's who people see who survivors are. But really, there isn't any typical survivor. Um, you can be raped at any age. 
you can be from any background, you can um, have a disability, um, lots of different people. And of course, men are raped as well. Um, you know, so there's a real variety of, of survivors that we support, and there's not really a typical survivor. And um, what binds them together is that experience of rape and sexual abuse and living with the impacts of that, which is often long term and learning to um, live with that and to um, recover. Yeah. Would it be fair to say that there is still quite a stigma attached to the, you know, someone coming forward and saying, I was raped, I was assaulted? Yeah, I think, I think there is a stigma. I think people fear that they won't be believed, that they're going to be judged, that people are going to blame them um, for their own assault. But um, anyone who comes to us for support, we always believe and we never judge. Um, it's not your fault that you were raped and we're here for any survivor that wants support. So obviously amazing work that you do. And we've just talked there about pre-pandemic. Let's talk about what changed. So when the pandemic hit, when lockdown, the first lockdown hit, what changed with the service that you were able to provide, Isabel? So we moved really quickly to obviously stop our face-to-face -face support when we had to do that, um, to providing um, all our support either online or over the phone. So we um, act, uh, use um, really secure um, online platform to provide counselling um, and also a lot of phone support. We also extended our helpline hours because we were really aware that we wanted um, survivors to have um, access to more immediate support if they needed it rather than you know waiting for counselling appointments so we extended our helpline hours which you know operationally for us which was a, a feat because we'd been providing the helpline on one landline for the past 30 years so we had to <laughs> work out and invest in a new system to enable yeah. us to move it around you know um, uh, move it around mobiles but yeah. there was a big impact on survivors as well that first lockdown our referrals dropped off a cliff, which is really worrying because it's not that rape and sexual abuse isn't happening. It's that women didn't feel confident or safe enough to come forward or, and seek support. Or also survivors were maybe in situations where they were living with people that maybe didn't know they were survivors or, you know, often, you know, majority of survivors are women as well. And we know throughout the pand pandemic that women were taking on a lot of those additional caring responsibilities, running homes, working from home as well, looking after children who are at home. So they weren't maybe able to prioritize their own well-being through that. Yeah. And so we saw referrals drop off. But then what also happened is those survivors that we were engaged with us and we were supporting were needing more and more intensive support because often they're living with those long-term impacts which can be mental health issues, anxiety, depression, and that the lockdown was um, exacerbating all those issues for them. So they were needing more intensive support because they were struggling. And you know, we saw that other service words were withdrawing as well as they were, you know, dealing with the challenges of lockdown. So it was a it was a really um, challenging time for us and a challenging time for survivors but we were really proud of our staff and volunteers who kind of took up the baton and, and made it work. Something that I've talked about quite a bit actually on the radio show um, to various groups is that pressure cooker effect and I would imagine that that will have been relevant as well for the situation that many of the people that you have worked with many of the women you have worked with found themselves in like you say, they were in environments perhaps where they didn't feel entirely safe and this pressure cooker effect was building. And when they normally might have come to you, come to one of these peer support groups, perhaps they weren't able to do that. Yeah, exactly that. Um, an absolute pressure cooker for some people, managing their own mental health, looking after children who would otherwise be in at school. And if you think when, you know, our ideal, what we normally try and create for survivors is a safe space that they can access support in. And we normally do that in physical buildings where we've thought about, you know, how do we protect that therapeutic space for them? How do we make it confidential? How do we make it anonymous? We've done all that. But when you're trying to do that in your own home, when you're living with people who maybe don't know that you're a survivor accessing support where, you know, you maybe don't have a private space you know we had women 
go into their cars to ring us, you know, because that was the only space. And women who just couldn't access support because it wasn't safe for them at that time, you know, so it really is difficult. And then I suppose the other added thing is for those going through trials, you know, who had reported to the police and were waiting for a, a, a trial of their rape, they were all delayed, um, often a very short notice. And so that, that they're all, you know, delayed for maybe a year, maybe a bit longer, which, you know, the emotional toil of that is really significant. Yeah. Gosh, well, let's talk a little bit about the County Durham Community Foundation. Now, obviously we'll talk about the grant, the help that you have just received from them, but when did you first become aware of them and the help they were able to offer? Yeah, we've had a long relationship with them and it's really important that there's funders like the County Durham Community Foundation because you know we're a small local organisation that does really specialist work and we're not big at all, you know, we've got about 20 staff, about the same number of volunteers and that's it and um, they for a long time have supported us uh, with different grants supporting different bits and pieces and they're a real really um, I suppose collaborative funder as well, where we've been able to go and talk to them and say, you know, we need support with this project or, um, you know, we've been struggling here and they've been able to support us. So it's been quite a long standing relationship we've had with them. So the Community Foundation, really, the help they're able to offer is a lifeline. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. it's a massive lifeline. And it is as well because they um, are like some other funders, they want to support us in the work that we already do and are good at, you know, whereas some funders, um, you know, for different reasons, it's understandable, they always want the next new project. Whereas, you know, we do want to do new projects, obviously, but also we've got work that we do every day, all the time that we're good at, that survivors need. And so to be able to get support for that work is really important. When you said the referrals dropped off a cliff at the start of lockdown, what did you do? How? how did you go about trying to work out what was going on we talked to survivors um so we um put out quite quickly after the first month or so a survey to those survivors that we were working with and we you know where we had relationships where we were talking with them regularly we um we rang and spoke to them to find out what was happening um and obviously we don't know uh what was happening with those that we are in contact with but we can assume from those that we are, you know, that it was that, you know, some weren't feeling safe, some just too much going on to be able to prioritise their own needs. Um, and that's why we um, extended the helpline hours so that the, the, there was an easy way for survivors to contact us and get really quick emotional support if they needed it. Um, which was- That's really important, isn't it? In certain yeah. situations, that instant accessibility. Absolutely. I mean, it's really difficult because we have such high demand for our services. For counselling, there is a waiting list and it is long, um, which, you know, isn't nice. It isn't, it isn't what we want. But the helpline, people can ring and there's someone there that they can talk to who's specially trained, who understands sexual violence and who can support them. So we made the decision to, you know, expand our hours um, to, uh, to make sure that support was there. Well, we talked about when you have received help in the past from the Community Foundation. Tell me about the recent grant that you got and what that's going to be used for, where it came from. Anyway, so what we've done is we've done regular checking calls during the periods that we've not been able to have face to face groups. And when we have been, we've been doing face to face again, but with all the um, restrictions, which has been interesting as well, because you know, obviously normally half of that group is crafting together, having cups of tea, bringing in cake, sharing, you know, it's all of that. So we've had to really think through how you do that kind of work together without, you know, touching. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot, I mean, businesses, organisations, services, you've had to really be creative haven't you? And that's the one thing that's really stood out when I've done interviews on the radio and I've talked to people. The creativity has been unbelievable. I've used the word pivot more times over the last year or so than ever before in my life, because that's what businesses are doing. That's what organisations like yourselves, you, you having to think differently and work differently. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we had to, so normally they'd be, you know, knitting together or we've done rag rugs together, which is all about sharing you know, and we've done baking, you know, decorating cakes, but that's all, if you're sharing materials, it just all gets too complicated. So one of the things we've been doing is more drawing because if everyone can have their own, um, their own pad and pens and all, all of that, then that's something that we can do. And, um, and we've also been doing more quizzes, that sort of thing, people bringing um, quizzes. So yeah, and we're just about to, once we're through this next little bit, um, probably after Easter, we're just about to start the group again, face to face. And that's what this fund has been supportive. In. And I suppose it's allowing us that space to think through how you do support, provide that safe, supportive space for um, survivors during this really challenging period yeah. where things are changing so often and um, you know um, and also as well supporting the volunteers who run that group because it's it's run by volunteers um, and they they need that support to enable them to do that as well. Yeah and this is £9,000 this is a, it's a good grant which fund does it come from because obviously the foundation distributes on behalf of funds so where's it come from it's from the community safety fund which is provided through um the office of the durham police crime and victims commissioner um and they've been great throughout the pandemic not just with this fund but we've had other funds from uh, from them to support us to kind of move our operations to working remotely and all of that um but you know they the the pcevc um are really supportive and really prioritise supporting survivors of sexual violence and we're really appreciative of that support. You know, we've talked an awful lot as well over the last year or so, it's scary when you think about the fact that we are coming up to a year, about social isolation and a group like the group that you've described, the peer support, even just sitting with someone, you don't necessarily have to talk to them, you sat with somebody can be, again, I use the word lifeline, because in that situation, isolation, it's one of the worst things you can go through, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think isolation has been one of the biggest challenges for the survivors that we we support this year. Um, I mean, as it has been for everyone, but when you're living with the impacts of, of sexual violence, like I've said, that can impact your life in lots of different ways and um, make, I suppose, when you're living with maybe anxiety, depression, social anxiety, it can make your world so much smaller. And then when we've had the restrictions of lockdown on top of that, that isolation is just compounded. Mm -hmm. And so groups like this are really important to give survivors a space where they can build their networks back up again and and I suppose share in a in a space that feels safe and non-judgmental as well. So the grant really will make a difference to to women's lives to survivors lives absolutely it'll make a really big difference you know this is the only group of its type locally a group specifically for survivors of sexual violence in darlington and county durham and we'd love to be um starting more of these groups all over the county because we know that um we cover all of darlington and county durham and there's areas of county durham that um we are not accessing or that um you know, it's much harder for survivors to get into Durham or Darlington or Chesley Street or yeah. because of, you know, the rurality, the public transport access. And so we want to be, you know, much more spread out than we are because we know that this sort of support is really valuable. Um, but this this group was one of our first try at doing peer support. And it's been it's been going nearly two years now and it's really successful. So we want to be replicating that across the county. Yeah. It's about empowerment as well, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, it is exactly about empowerment. We don't, we don't um, change survivors' lives. Survivors do it themselves. You know, we just give people the tools and the support and the space, the safe space um, to do that. And that's part of what peer support is as well. It's about relying on each other. It's about listening to each other and learning together. It's about, uh, it's about empowering women. Yeah. Talking of, I mean, International Women's Day, obviously, in the news around now. So let's talk a little bit then about 
the impact of inequality um, in the lives of women, particularly the women you work with, you know, and how your project, you try and redress that balance. Yeah, so um, what we what we do um, to support survivors um, directly impacts inequality. Like if you are living with the long term impacts of sexual violence, how that impacts you financially, if you don't feel that you're able to work, impacts your family life, um, impacts, you know, your education. We're supporting young people who are, who are in school, college, in university. If you are living if you've been assaulted and then you're living with those impacts, how, how is that affecting your education, your outcomes for later life? And if we can we can get in and give you the specialist support you need when you need it, that can have a massive impact on the whole rest of your life. I think people think of rape sometimes as a one-off action. And yes, it is sometimes, but the impact of that throughout women's lives is massive and can really impact the outcomes that they then go on to achieve. And so if we give people the support that they need, we can make a real difference to the inequality women experience. Yeah. There might be people who hear us talk like that and say, well, what, what are you talking about? You know, women have been unfairly biased for the last few years now. What would you say to that? Well, I'd say, look at the rape statistics. Like it's not a crime that is going away and it's not a crime that, um, the justice system is meeting the needs of at the minute. Um, you know, one in five women will experience serious sexual assault in their lifetime. You know, that is not an insignificant amount. And the impact of that on women's lives and on inequality more broadly is massive. And, you know, we are here as an organisation to support survivors and we will continue to be here until, you know, there isn't rape anymore. Mm, absolutely. So given what we've talked about, given the fact you're at, you're at the cool face, if you like, you know, you see what goes on, you talk to women, you hear from women, you counsel women, you know about the issues that affect their lives on a daily basis when it comes to rape, when it comes to sexual abuse and assault. What do you think can be done? And you've already said, you know, that the rape statistics are, are still way up there. What could be done perhaps from a government level then to try and change, to try and help their situations, Isabel? Well, I think... At a basic level, survivors should be able to access specialist support when they need it. And we know that not just locally for us, but across the country, there's much more demand for rape crisis services than we have the capacity to meet. And I think, you know, if you're raped, you should be able to access support from that. And I know and the government is making efforts and does fund our support. But, you know, we have you know, a really significant waiting list, um, normally between six and nine months, people wait for counselling from us. And I, I you know... That's a long time, isn't it? That's it is a, a long, long time. time. For somebody who's in a, who knows, you know, you can't, unless you're in that situation, you can't be late, can you? No. So, you know, and we do our best with that. And it's one of the reasons we have the helpline. But, you know, that is the biggest challenge for us. You know, we we want to be there to support survivors when they need us and we will always be there and continue to be. But the demand for our support is much higher um, than than we have the funding to meet. And then on top of that, you have the issues in the criminal justice um, system where um, already prosecution rates were really low for rape. And then on. So that makes you know, going through that process, really horrible, traumatic and challenging when um, the likelihood of a guilty verdict is very slim. And then now on top of that, you know, unavoidably, there's no one to blame for this, but the delays because of COVID has put on the system mm. has made that even more challenging for survivors. Um, and so we need to think about, you know, how we achieve justice for um, survivors of rape and sexual violence. It's been a really tough year for everyone, obviously, not least for the women you work with. For you as a service, I would imagine, have you had some some really low points, Isabel? Any points that you think, oh, my goodness, that was a tough day? Yeah, definitely. I mean, just making it all work, you know, moving a rape crisis centre to work all remote is really hard work in a really short space of time. But I was just so proud and grateful 
for the staff and volunteers that we do have because they really made it work um which you know is a lot to ask we're asking staff and volunteers to take the trauma of sexual violence into their own homes and that that's a lot so we've had to think really carefully about how we support our staff and volunteers to do that but i'm really proud of us as an organization for you know still being here still being here for survivors and making it work but we've had great days as well you Tell know me about the great days about the high point. <laughs> well you know we're still supporting survivors through the criminal justice system. We're still getting survivors to court, supporting them in court when they need it. And, you know, the days when you do get guilty verdicts are great. And also the feedback we get for survivors from the counselling support is amazing. And, you know, so we know we are, are supporting survivors in the way that they need to. And then the really great times is which makes you feel that you've made the right decisions is, is when you have someone call the helpline for the first time and they've never told anyone what happened to them before and they reach out for that first time for support and we're able to be there for them. That That's, that's really important as well. So it has been a really challenging year, but I'm really proud of us. I'm really proud of our staff and volunteers and there's been great moments in that too. Absolutely, yeah. And it must be great when a survivor comes to you and having perhaps attended a group or just had a conversation with someone and they've said something you know like that you know that's that's brightened my day that's made a difference to my day that's made a difference to my week my month yeah absolutely and I think the groups are where you see that most is when you see you know particularly I can't wait until we're back after Easter with the group because I know um, the women that attend the group have been incredibly isolated and know the difference it's going to make when they are able to come together again, see each other, support each other um, and, and just have a cup of tea together. You know, it's those <laughs> simple things, isn't it? It's all we, we want, all isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bit of social interaction rather than stood, you know, who knows, at the bottom of a driveway from someone, yeah. a couple of metres away from someone. Um, and again, with, you know, the International Women's Day theme, and we talked already a little bit about inequality, how, let's, let's talk to, to the layman, I guess, is, is there a way that we can all try and help reduce that inequality when it comes to women? I think that we could all think about the rape myths that we we endorse and support you know it's about how we believe survivors when they when they disclose something to us how we judge them and you know what what do we think about rape you know if you're thinking that um that you know she was wearing a short skirt what did she expect or she was drunk what did she expect or you know oh, he would never do that. I, I know him, he would never do that. You know, it is on all of us to believe and support survivors and to think about the rape myths that maybe we all, maybe unconsciously have in our brains. And I think that's the biggest way, you know, as a society, we can, um, we can work to end rape and support survivors. Is there a role the media needs to play in that then? Yeah, I think so. I think... The media um, needs to think about how they um, promote rape myths as well. I think I think it's got better more recently, but I think often um, when rapes are featured in TV or, or even on the news as well, the ones that are profiled are often like stranger rapes when we know that you're much more likely to be raped by someone you know than a stranger down an alley and that makes people feel that you know if they if, you know if they've been raped by their dad their uncle their boyfriend the husband if they report that they they might not be believed and so you know the media has um a role to play in in kind of how they support those rape myths and and how they report on rapes as well yeah um we've heard a little bit about well, we've heard a lot from the Prime Minister about his roadmap and fingers crossed that it all runs and goes to plan and that those dates that he mentioned, those all important dates actually happen. And you've already talked about this group restarting after Easter, which would be absolutely fantastic. What are your hopes for the future for your service, for the women that you help, Isabel? I, I want them to get the support that they, they need. So, you know, for us, we um, we want to be back providing face to face support. We've continued to do a little bit of it where we've needed to, you know, particularly for those who are going through the criminal justice pro process and are at court. But, you know, I want us to be back providing face to face counselling and for women to be able to access that safe 
space that are in our buildings that we've not been able to for so long, particularly those women who haven't been able to throughout the pandemic access any support because they haven't got a safe space in their own homes or a confidential space in their own home. Yeah. Are there, is, would there be plans, do you think, for it's one of those things, isn't it? I was going to say for growth, but actually you don't want that to happen because, of course, you want to try and reduce the number of people who have to come to you. Yours is one of those services that we're so pleased we have, but you kind of wish you didn't have to have it. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, every day we're trying to put ourselves out of a job. But the reality is that I do, I want to see us grow as a service because there's much more demand than we can meet at, uh, at the minute. So I would love to see um, us have more outreach right across the county, um, us to be meet, reaching groups of survivors that we don't at the minute. Um, but ultimately I would like to see, you know, referrals go down. I would like to see less reports, but I, I can't see that happening anytime soon. Time soon. And grants like the one that you received from the County Durham Community Foundation make such a difference to the service you provide and to the women, the survivors you provide that service for. Yeah, we're so grateful for it. It may not seem like a big thing or a lot of money, but being able to provide a safe space for groups of women, of survivors to come together and support each other is so important for us and for an organisation to have that funding and support means us that we can keep going and keep being here for survivors locally. Let's talk a little bit about the positive effect that you see. So when you've helped a survivor, when a woman has come to you and they've been at their lowest point, their lowest ebb, and you've been able to help them gradually, I would imagine it's a gradual process for an awful lot of women. When they, you know, have worked their way through, I guess, or they've just settled themselves into your service, what sort of positive effects, what do you see in them, the changes in them, Isabel? Well, I think one of the biggest changes that we can see is a growth in confidence. Um, I mean, and we particularly see that in the group, you know, we have people come who are maybe not confident to speak for a lot of times before, um, uh, you know, come a few times before they're able to speak, you know, and, and then they might feel confident enough to share a little. And then, you know, by the time, by after a few months, we can see them sharing um, not just their experiences and talking about that, but also sharing their skills. So we, we uh, for example, have had a woman who um, didn't, didn't speak in the group for ages and ages, but then um, slowly started sharing and then felt confident enough to share one of the things she was most interested in, which was cooking. And so, and then led a session around that. And, you know, that's, mm. that's a big change in someone's confidence. But then in other ways as well, you know, we are able to provide people with information and support and help them think through what actions they might like to take. So would they want to report to the police or do they not want to do that? And, you know, just making those decisions and having that information can feel incredibly empowering as well and help them, you know, move forward in a way that they weren't able to before. Yeah. Um, and also thinking about the relationships and, you know, we, I think we all in our lives have relationships or have had relationships that maybe don't feel comfortable or don't feel supportive. And, you know, through talking through what they feel and look like, um, we see people, survivors being able to put boundaries in place and maybe step away from um, relationships that, that aren't good for them or aren't supportive as well. So it can be right across um, it can be really can be right across. And that positive effect is a, has a ripple effect as well, doesn't it? To the people that are surrounding those survivors, those women, it could be younger family members and they see that empowerment and they learn from it and they grow through it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, thinking about a lot of the women that we support are mothers. And then if they are feeling more confident, you know, making um, decisions that they feel comfortable with about their lives for their families you know that's them impacting on their whole family on their children and on their daughters as well which is going to mm -hmm. impact you know for generations across isn't it um yeah. it can make a, a real onwards impact as well yeah it has a generational effect so it, it could be i guess in one of your groups that eventually when someone does like you say find the strength to speak up to share a skill you could be quite shocked and impressed by the skills that these women have 
yeah absolutely there's stuff that we do that i had no clue um uh, people knew or knew how to do <laughs> and it's it's um it, it's also just such a joy seeing people who are, you know learning from people who are passionate about something isn't it and yeah. it's a joy to share that as well isn't it and it's bonding you know to be able to learn and share from each other um so yeah we've done loads of different things we've made rag rugs we've done cooking drawing painting you know we did so much watercolors at one point that they made um christmas cards that we sold to raise money for the center you know yeah. it makes it's lots of different things yeah the county Durham community foundation really make sure that the money goes to the people who really need it don't they they direct it to the right places yeah absolutely and you know of course there's roles for big charities that work at a national level but we need small charities that know their community that are talk directly to the communities that they support in our case survivors and that shape their services to meet those needs and we we wouldn't survive without funders like county durham community foundation um because we just need that local support um, and without it, we wouldn't have a rape crisis centre in Darlington. We just wouldn't be here. Yeah. Well, Isabel, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for sharing, for telling me a little bit about what you do as a service. And um, it's been great to learn about it and to find out more. Um, I just wish you the best of luck with everything that you are doing right now and obviously with what's to come in the future. No, thank you so much, Lisa. That's been great.